Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the FL India Limited conference call to discuss Q2 FY24 earnings hosted by LRS Securities Private Limited. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that the conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Karan Tarani from Elara Securities Private Limited. Thank you and over to you, sir. Thank you, Akshay. Uh, good morning, everyone. On behalf of Elara Capital, we welcome you all to Q2 and H1 FI24 conference call of Apple India Limited. I take this opportunity to welcome the management of Apple India Limited, represented by Mr. Anush Karna Sofam, who is the managing director and chief executive officer of the company and Mr. Kapil Bhutani, who is the Chief Financial and Operations Officer of the company. Before we begin with the discussion, I would like to remind you that some of the statements made in today's conference call may be forward-looking in nature and may involve some risk and uncertainties. Kindly refer to slide 24 of company's Q2 earnings presentation for a detailed disclaimer. I will now hand over the call to Mr. Anush Karna Soham for his opening remarks. Thanks, and over to you, Anush. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining the call today. I trust all of you are keeping in good health, and I wish all of you a blessed Deepavali celebration ahead. H1 FY 2024 marked a strategic transformational milestone in our journey as Apple India. We have come a long way since 2006 and will conclude FY 2024 as our 18th financial year. Based on our past performance trends, we are well poised to reach INR 18 billion or 1800 crores of revenue this year as we look ahead towards achieving our growth vision 2030. In Q2 FY 2024, we attained our highest quarterly revenue run rate, highest EBITDA, highest consumer conversion, and the highest CPC rate. We continue to enhance our consumer centric platform offerings as well as leverage synergies towards overall operating margin expansion, delivering Stronger than ever, quarterly EBITDA of Rs. 872 million. We attained revenue growth of 21.6% year-on-year and fat growth of 13.8% year-on-year in Q2 FY 2024. Our CPCU business achieved 72 million conversions during the quarter at a CPCU rate of Rs. 55.6. That resulted in CPCU revenue of over Rs. 4 billion or 4, uh, 400 crores an increase of 21.6% year-on-year. In terms of H1 FY 2024, we achieved revenue growth of 19.3% year-on-year and fat growth of 16.7% year-on-year. Overall, for H1, our CPCU revenue increased by 19.4% year-on-year. Our CPCU business continues to be resilient and underlines the long-term sustainable business momentum. Our strong anchoring in India and global emerging markets enabled us to perform well. Our growth for India and global emerging markets combined was about 20% year-on-year, and almost all of it was organic. Notably, this is despite the fact that there was a pullback effect of about Rs. 110 million or 11 crores due to regulatory changes towards applicability of GSP within the online gaming industry in India. However, this impact was completely offset by the all-round broad-based growth in advertiser spend across other industry verticals in India. So if we were to exclude this impact of online gaming industry, our growth performance in India would have been much superior. However, global emerging markets performed really well for us and grew by about 28% year-on-year, wherein this growth was also majorly all organic. That gives us confidence that the broader market tailwinds in India and global emerging markets continue to be intact, and that is almost 75% of our current revenue. Speaking of developed markets now, I'm happy to confirm that our decisive turnaround plan has started to yield positive results, where we expect consistent growth, particularly from the lens of second half of FY 2024, and that is despite the pullback effect in the fintech vertical, in the last quarter of about 140 million, about 14 crore rupees. 
our realigned approach towards upselling, cross-selling, integrated consumer platform propositions with emphasis on premium and key resilient verticals. With our highest number of full-time full-time team members anchored in the developed markets still date, instill confidence in us to deliver broad-based, consistent growth from here onwards in developed markets. Despite the combined impact of INR's 250 million or about 25 crores from the online gaming in India and from fintech in developed markets. We delivered the highest revenue and EBITDA ever in this quarter, and our CPCU business continues to be resilient and positions us strongly for multi-year growth ahead of us. We are consistently enhancing our strategic moats towards building sustainable global market positions. And I would like to highlight key anchor initiatives that we have undertaken to power our long-term sustainable growth momentum. The first area I would like to highlight is OEM anchoring partnerships. We are strengthening our strategic partnerships with greater scope, deeper touch points to enable premium use cases across OEM ecosystems and app stores. We have secured our partnership with Samsung in India for their Samsung platform 12 touch points across the premium Samsung Galaxy App Store and Discover Services placement, where two phases of development and integration have been achieved as of the last quarter, and we are expecting to attain completion of the most significant phase three in 2023 itself. We have also completed development and integration on Lenovo smartphones across all major international markets, including North America, Europe, Japan, Korea, Southeast Asia, and Latin. Next, anchoring Gen AI strategy. We are leveraging our core R&D capabilities and are investing in emerging technology for our customers globally with key emphasis on pursuing new tech IP and innovative use cases for responsible integration of generative AI technology. We have recently released our first Gen AI powered product, which is a multilingual keyword recommendation tool for our iOS, Apple, App Store search ads advertising platform. This will automate advertisers play across search touch points to scale their iOS user acquisitions effectively on Apple App Store and engage vernacular audiences who search for apps in their native language. These are all significant achievements, and we are more ready than ever before with our products, partnerships and people, and our overall position in the ecosystem is much stronger to unlock sustainable multi-year growth ahead of us. We also want to congratulate all our shareholders and investors for their trust and support has enabled the success in our ongoing strategic fundraise process. Apple India secured a commitment letter from Gamnet Private Limited, which is an entity of the Ministry of Finance, Government of Singapore, for their binding offer to invest rupees 7.49 billion or approximately USD 90 million in our company, and this will definitely strengthen our next four years of strategic growth initiative. This is a certificate of credibility and the confidence in our resilience as a company, and that has inspired even greater loyalty in all the applicants towards ensuring consistent success and value creation for all our stakeholders against all the odds. Continuing to share our customer success stories this time, we have included three more case studies, which are focused on online trading, fashion growth with a vernacular approach, and loyalty program for a global FMCG company. Apple continues to be recognized as an industry thought leader. Our platform was named amongst the top mobile advertising companies in 2023 on business of apps. One of our platforms was recognized as a high performer at the G2 Fall Report 2023, as well as won an award in the Connected TV category at Agency Reporters Front Benches 2023 Awards. Another platform was recognized as the best in data technology in E4M Real-Time Awards and won silver in programmatic category at MMA Smarty. With that, I now hand over our discussion to our CFO, Kapil Bhutani, to discuss the financials. Thank you. Over to you, Kapil. Thank you, Nish, and a very good morning to everyone on the call. Hope all of you are keeping safe and well. In Q2 financial year 24, 
The company reported revenue from operations of rupees 4,313 million, that is 431.3 crores, a growth of 21.6 year on year. We delivered a broad based growth of about 20% YOY across global emerging markets, including India. Emerging markets continue to be in high growth momentum with, growth, with strong operating profit performance. $8,379 billion, that is 837.9 crores, a growth of 19.3% year on year. Our EBITDA for uh, the quarter stood at 872 million rupees, that is 87.2 crores, an increase of 20.6% year on year. Our EBITDA margin stood at 20.2%. Despite acquisitive consolidation, our EBITDA margin was in the line of Q2 last year while it improved about 100 basis points on sequential basis. In H1 financial year 24, our EBITDA increased by 17.3% by OY and uh, by uh, 2 rupees 1,653 million, that is 165.3 crores, while the EBITDA margin stood at 19.7%. In terms of OPEX, driven by our consistent effort towards enabling platform synergies and greater productivity, our data inventory cost stood at 60.5% of the revenue from operations in this quarter, resulting in improved operational efficiencies and better margin utilization on both year-on-year -year and sequential basis. Our employee cost as well as other expenses remain relatively stable sequentially and increased by 2.1% and 6.4% respectively on quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. Our profit after tax for the quarter stood at rupees 668 million, that is 66.8 crores, an increase of 13.8% year on year. We had an impact of high interest cost of rupees 27 million rupees, that is about 2.7 crores, in this quarter due to new term loan availed by our subsidiary for acquisition of UIP business. As well as a higher amortization, the increased amortization was account on account of intangible assets that were put in use in this amortization of identified assets of acquisition of URP. And this increase is in line with our historical Q2 trend. We remain focused on our working capital management as such there, uh, there were no material changes in our collection this month. Our OCF operating cash flow for H1 stood at 989 million rupees, that is 98.9 crores, which is close to our target of 80% OCF to PAT ratio for H1. Further, in regards to our commitment received for, uh, from Gamut uh, PAT PT Limited, our several subsidiary of Ministry of Finance, Government of Singapore, the utilization of net proceeds is intended towards three identified uses and rest towards general corporate purposes. One, uh, uh, one of the uses is about 335 crores towards investment in technology and platform products. Second is 150 crores towards inorganic opportunities and 75 crore rupees towards repayment of outstanding liabilities for past acquisition. Please refer to our objects of the issue for detailed disclosure that is given in our notice of our EGM and is available on stock exchange as well as mailed to our shareholders. Looking ahead, given the anchoring uh, growth initiatives that Anuj has discussed earlier in this call, we are ready with our generative AI initiatives and are stronger than ever before with our products, platform, partnerships, and positions in ecosystem. We remain confident for long-term prospects. We'll continue to invest to drive sustainable profit growth for FY24 and beyond. With this, I end my presentation. Let's please open the floor for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to only use handset while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. First question is from the line of Karan Thorani from LRA Securities. Please go ahead. 
Uh, hi. Hi, Anuj. Uh, so the question was pertaining to the uh, India business. You mentioned clearly that the gaming vertical uh, has led uh, to a lower growth here. Uh, but uh, what are the other verticals, uh, you know, that are kind of doing well or possibly, uh, you know, could see offsetting negative impact uh, of the gaming vertical? That's one. And secondly, uh, what is the normal case scenario for the uh, India business in terms of growth over the next uh, two to three quarters? Because Historically, if you look at the growth, uh, it's been, you know, uh, very good at, you know, 20% and uh, 20% plus kind of numbers. So, should we assume that uh, for the next three quarters, India business could be at uh, mid-teens to low-teens? Well, thanks for your question, uh, Karan. Uh, well, it is, it is part of my, you know, detailed commentary that, yes, the GST uh, impact on the gaming industry in India uh, you know, definitely uh, has had a measurable impact, and we have quantified it as well. That about 11 crores or 110 million rupees worth of uh, pullback effect uh, has to be, uh, you know, measured in that sense. And had we got that, I think you would, or if we were to eliminate the impact of that, and we just see uh, non-gaming to non-gaming comparison, you know, our growth has been very, very resilient. And you know that we are a broad-based um, uh, company. You know, we have over 10 industry verticals that we have already named for everyone. In the categories, we have GH, which includes entertainment, e-commerce, education tech, it includes uh, fintech, food tech, FMCG, uh, you know, gaming is just one of the categories, uh, and then, you know, we, of, of course, have healthcare, hospitality, and so on, and a lot of these categories are, you know, having broad-based set of advertisers working with us, and this is where the strength of Apple is, uh, you know, most clear, and it gives me a lot of confidence, also, as well as, you know, a matter of pride, that we are, you know, broad-based sufficiently to be able to take the impact of even an 11 crore pullback in, uh, uh, in the gaming industry uh, for us in the last quarter. But yet, if you see overall, India did really well to keep up, to neutralize that impact. And also global emerging markets, you know, where we saw broad-based growth across all our industry verticals. Overall, across emerging markets, we were still able to achieve 20% growth year on year, mostly all organic because of this broad-based risk managed approach. Now, going forward, uh, on a normalized scenario where there's no one-off event or, you know, surprise events in impacting and, you know, because whenever there is any such surprise event, there will be a little bit of a hiccup until the industry finds its feet again, that particular uh, segment of the industry finds its feet again and gets back into a certain predictable rhythm and pattern. Now, uh, my long-term belief is uh, and emphasis is very clear. We have a multi-year growth trend ahead of us because in emerging markets like India and global emerging markets, the advertisers are under-calibrated on digital. I expect 50 to 60% of the ad spend to decisively go to digital in the next three to four years. And therefore, we will see broad-based growth trends. And yes, we should calibrate it within that range, around 20%. Right, thanks. Very useful. Uh, the second question was around the international business. Uh, uh, so, you know, even excluding UIP, uh, we have seen a better performance in the international business. Uh, but uh, if you can give us some sense in terms of the U.S. Uh, business, you know, when is that standing? Because I think we're expecting some kind of a turnaround there as well. So what is the kind of uh, growth rate there? What is the kind of traction there? Are things as to plan? And then on the other emerging nations uh, apart from India. Sure. So, uh, see, the way to see our business, and of course our reporting, you know, since pre-IPO to now has been India International, but we have been adding more color and emphasis around the way to see it is India, other global emerging markets, and then developed markets, because the behavior patterns of India and emerging markets globally seem to be a lot similar, and that's almost 75% of our business. And then roughly 25% is let's say, developed markets. And in those developed markets, again, uh, we have quantified it that barring one, okay, first of all, all all the internal, um, you know, decisive steps that we have taken to turn around the, all the internal issues of the company, I think that has already been well-rested, settled, and we are in a very positive 
spirit and momentum to go ahead and capture the growth that we deserve. In terms of our team, our people on the ground, I think the spirit and motivation, and I'm speaking, I've just come back, you know, uh, from a sales off side of our North America developed market focus team on, you know, plans for how we continue to grow from here. The pipeline is strong. The spirit is strong. So I think all of those internal issues are taken, being fully addressed now. In terms of the external issues, I think all the uh, pipeline and the results of all the industry verticals that we are addressing in developed markets in the U.S. are all doing well except for the one that we again quantified for you in my commentary where we talked about fintech. Because of the interest rates on, on loans being so high, I think there is there is a pullback effect in that in the last quarter itself and we quantified it to be about 14 crores. And had that not been the case, you know, and, you know, of course, you factor in these things, you're talking about 25 crores of revenue, which we could have absolutely, you know, seen coming in the pipeline, but didn't happen because of India gaming and uh, developed market fintech vertical. Even without those, um, you know, that even, you know, without that revenue and the pullback effect that happened, we saw fairly resilient growth across other verticals. And gaming has been a positive vertical in developed markets uh, for us, while, of course, in India, that wasn't, uh, you know, so positive in the last quarter. So I think uh, developed markets-wise, we have a lot of confidence right now that our team, our product, the way we are, uh, you know, providing unique propositions on premium placements, even on Apple ecosystem, I think we have a very, very strong position um, I would say I'm bullish today more than ever before in terms of our position in developed markets. And I say that with uh, with U.S., of course, as the anchor market, but also uh, seeing it extend towards Europe as well as Japan. Thank you. That's it for my Thank you. The next question is from the line of Mayank from Inam AMC. Please go ahead. Mayank? Mayank? Yeah, hi. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Yeah. Good morning. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, I wanted to. I was wondering what was the contribution from UFI during the quarter? Because uh, last quarter we had around 45 crores of uh, contribution in two months of consolidation. If we just adjust for that in this quarter, means assuming equal contribution, so around 67 crores was uh, from UFI. And then the YOY growth rate, uh, you know, falls significantly to 2.5% YOY. And the two main sources of impact that you quantified were 11 crores from emerging markets and 14 crores from developed markets. So uh, am I on the right track? Is this right? Uh, so um, um, on the UIP, uh, yes. it is it, uh, it is not very sequential, as we are uh, as Anish mentioned that we are onto integration path. So there is a somewhat of consolidation of revenue on the UIP side, and uh, it cannot be seen and cons uh, consolidated uh, on a linear way as uh, for the last quarter. Okay. So sorry, yeah. we, uh, so even if you're largely correctly, and the way, you're doing the math largely correctly, and the way to look at it is that most of the contribution uh, from UIP is obviously towards developed markets. Now, in the developed markets, uh, you know, we have seen uh, a combined effect that, yes, we are stronger than ever before. But the fact that, you know, we did quantify that about 14 crores in fintech uh, category was um, uh, was the pullback effect in the last quarter. Now, if we take that into the uh, overall account of what we said, so, again, the way you have to um, uh, look at our business is saying India and emerging markets is largely organic growth. And that together is 20%. Then in developed markets, there is a pullback effect as well, uh, and there is an add-up to the fact that uh, you have UAP added for one additional month, and when you do the math of that, therefore you see developed markets, there is a growth of approximately 
uh, 10 odd crores or 10 to 11 crores because you see an addition of, uh, you see a minus of 14, but you see an addition of around 20 plus uh, crores for the additional months of UAP. And that's how, because I know you're slicing and dicing it that way, what I would just encourage you to look at it is, and also tie it up with my commentary, is India, global emerging market, and then that 20% year-on-year growth. So what, what happened in developed markets? There is a pullback effect. That's about 14 crores. Then there is an addition of UAP. So I think that's how you look at the math. But, um, you know, sometimes over-analysis doesn't give you the essence of the business. And the essence of the business is that India and global emerging markets have very strong continuous state events. And in developed markets, together with UAP, now we have revised our position to be in a situation where we can look at consistent, uh, you know, growth going forward. And I think that is a very important turnaround that we wanted to achieve within this uh, year. And I think in the last quarter, we will see decisive and very clear numbers, you know, anchoring what I'm saying right now in the world. Sure, sure. Um, and I know in the beginning, uh, in the commentary, you mentioned about some partnership with uh, Samsung. Sorry, I missed that. Uh, could you uh, repeat that, please? Absolutely. So with Samsung in India, I mentioned, and I'm just quoting what I was saying earlier, largely the same words that I've said before. So our partnership is with Samsung in India for their Samsung platform, which has 12 touch points across and including the premium Samsung Galaxy App Store and Discover services where we have already completed two phases of development and integrations with their technology and our technology, and we have also achieved uh, and you know absolute clarity that within this quarter, before the end of 2023, we will have the phase three, which is the most significant phase, uh, completely um, integrated and hopefully fully rolled out. Sure, sure. Thank you. I have a few questions. I'll uh, round up again in the queue. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Aditya Chandrasekhar from UBS. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, good morning. Just a couple of questions from my side. Uh, so on the CPCU uh, rate, we have almost uh, come to around 56 rupees uh, this quarter. Uh, you had previously said that the range would be, say, between 55 to 58 for the year. Just wanted to check if you think that we can kind of hit this uh, upper end of this range or even exceed it. And going forward ahead uh, into FI25, etc., how do you see this growth in CPCU rates? Is there a kind of theoretical uh, cap at which it stops uh, uh, growing? Uh, that's my first question. And second question, I just wanted to kind of get an update on the connected TV space. I think you had mentioned it last quarter, uh, just to get a sense of uh, how it is on the ground and uh, what's the kind of outlook for this space. Thank you. Aditya, thank you for the very important question. I think your question about CPCU and the pricing band of CPCU between 55 to 58 rupees and whether we will hit the upper end of the band is an important question, but not so much from a quantitative lens, but from a qualitative aspect. Please see that what Apple is doing is consistently moving up in the value chain to more premium segments of consumers, more premium segments um, and touch points, be it the partnership with Samsung on Galaxy Store touch points, be it the uh, you know, Gen AI-related product that is addressing vernacular capabilities on the Apple uh, app store search ads and so on and so forth. I think there is a very clear uh, message that is coming out in all our commentary and that message is directed towards uh, going to the more and more premium segments so that we can deliver higher value to the advertisers, right? When you get them better quality touch points, better quality of consumer audiences and, you know, greater tech-enabled powered experiences, you do better partnerships, you do better pricing, you know, and better pricing almost necessarily means better margin in most business models. So I think what Apple is trying to do consistently is to avoid, so we are a fast growth company and we never allow a fast, uh, you know, increasing revenue pace to, we will not want to give that power to our customer to bring the price down just because they're saying they're spending more with you. So the only way to defend that is to go more premium. You say, our products are becoming more premium, please pay more. We will deliver you more ROI, and therefore it all makes business sense. 
So what you see in our CPCU pricing and what you see in our product and partnership initiatives in my commentary today is influencing that and will definitely consistently inch upward and positive because we are building the company not just to deliver revenue growth, but deliver profitable cash flow positive, better margin revenue growth. And I think that endeavor will, the starting point of that is you're going to sell at the right price, you're going to sell something premium, and you need to take a defensible mode on those uh, ecosystem positions. Uh, and, and I think that's what we are doing with that. So thanks for asking that question. Connected to that is your second question of the CPV space. And the CPV is, um, is an important uh, strategy for us. Uh, not only because we are a consumer platform company and a lot of the consumer households are going to adopt connected TV uh, in emerging markets, in developed markets that has already happened in a, in a significant way. So you will see more and more connected TV as one of the influencing touch points for the consumer. So you will have smartphone devices in your home, you will have tablets in your home, you will have connected TV in your home. And how can we create an integrated consumer experience um, to drive conversion for the advertisers? And that's our endeavor. So connected TV product has been ready. Household Sync, which is an important enabler for how connected TV would connect to other connected devices in the household, is also something that we've been out with the market. And we have been consistently educating and building thought leadership across emerging markets with our customers. So we are seeing positive traction. However, uh, when a user converts for an advertiser, it would necessarily always be with some element of, okay, there was a touch point on mobile, there was a touch point on connected TV, and it has to work in conjunction. Uh, so it should not be, in our opinion, technology-wise, product-wise, proposition-wise, we don't want to segment it out, but we want to say it's an end-to-end consumer platform where you can connect with the consumer on one additional touch point, which is connected TV. And may that play a positive role in the consumer conversion that we deliver to the advertiser. I hope that answers your question. Got it. Very helpful. Thanks a lot. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Arun Prasad from Avendus Park. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Good morning, Anuj and Kapil. Uh, my first question is on the, uh, uh, the, the focus that you are uh, having on this OEM partnership in the last couple of quarters. I just, I'm just wondering, uh, this OEM partnership we always had to app mix. Uh, so what is this this time? It's uh, different from what we have been doing or what app mix was doing for uh, several years. Is it is it different materially? It, that means it's just uh, it's, uh, the, the partnership is only uh, differing in the size or it's qualitatively it's uh, much deeper. Can you help us understand uh, this, please? Yes. Uh, thanks for that question. Yes, premium partnerships uh, mean that, um, you know, let's say you're moving up the value chain within the partner ecosystem. Okay, so there are different let's say, touch points that one can go to. And I could safely say that going into the app store of an OEM partner and partnering with them on and around the app store is perhaps the highest um, premiumness that one could achieve. And um, and this is highlighted in, in the uh, commentary that I made earlier today. Uh, so going deeper with partners, means that you are, uh, you know, integrating tech at a deeper level. It also means that you are having a longer-term relationship with those partners, so a more predictable path for consistent growth, and you're doing higher impact. So not only is the partner important to us, but we become important to that partner uh, and take it to a new level. So what Appnex was doing before was, in my uh, assessment, a very important stepping stone to take on premium partnerships and deeper partnerships, which we have now, uh, you know, brought to a level of maturity that we can now start talking about some of those uh, partnerships uh, as I have updated in my call today, like the Samsung one or the Lenovo one and so on and so forth. There are, by the way, many more, but, you know, I'm only highlighting those that I think are of the level of premiumness or, uh, or, or the level of impact that would, give you a stronger indication to our strategy. Right. So, uh, uh, so which means that uh, um, you will have a much better conversion and uh, 
predictability of the conversion is also uh, that 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 removes the uncertainty from for the customer as well. That's that's uh, that's how we should say is. I think uh, what it will do for us is, uh, I mean, see, the conversion is always linked to the consumer. But what it is absolutely achieving for us when we have these kind of OEM deeper partnerships is that it's a message to the ecosystem that Apple as a platform will help the advertisers to reach the most premium segment of consumers to drive the most premium conversions and therefore Apple deserves a higher CPCO pricing and, it, you know, deserves a better margin and so on and so forth. And I think that is that is what premium mess does. And this is, you know, what I was trying to answer to the earlier question from Aditya as well when he asked, how is your CPCO pricing going to go up? So I think the answer is the same. But when you go and do premium products, right, where you're solving Gen AI, when you're going deeper on vernacular verticalization, when you go into the app stores and do deeper tech integrations and capabilities, then you go to the advertisers and you say, hey, I have all of these products, these partnerships, this ecosystem level market position, I deserve a better price. And of course, the advertiser would eventually judge it and say, if I'm paying you 56 rupees or 58 rupees CPCU, did they achieve the ROI that they had in mind in the campaign? So I think it, it makes business sense. And you're right that by having these partnerships, we are one step deeper and closer to charging more premium pricing to have better margins. And when we look at it with a four-year perspective, you know, can I reasonably say that these are multi-year, long-term, deeper integrations and partnerships? And then the answer is yes. Then you will get predictable, sustainable, you know, uh, modes around the company. And I think that is why we are bringing it up to your attention. So, so if I translate this in, in terms of numbers, current margins is, is is still have a lot of potential to go up. Uh, is this the right way of uh, reading this, uh, what you have said? Um, I think there is uh, there is already a good, uh, you know, outcome that we have delivered in the last quarter. You see, with all three months of URP fully loaded, and it's less than six months, by the way, since we acquired it, we have delivered over 20% EBITDA in this quarter. So, and you know, and we all know that any acquired company was, you know, is at the lower level of EBITDA than that. So that means minus that, the business is already, you know, on an organic basis, uh, you know, is in a healthier zone of, you know, much above 21%, 22%. And I think that is where, uh, you know, we are constantly striving and, and it's not just, you know, numbers, right? Numbers is a result of decisive action and clarity of strategy. And the clarity is go more premium, go more deeper, uh, build better products, build, you know, deeper connection, the partnership ecosystem, make sure it is a predictable long-term path, deliver uh, on the higher pricing ROI to the advertisers and inch it one step at a time. And that's how you, and that's how we're doing it. And therefore, I'm feeling that we are entering into this quarter um, as well as going into the next year, 2024, with a way more stronger position than we've ever had. Uh, just to add uh, 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 to what Anish said, you should look at it from the lens of sustainability and growth rather than from looking at the margin, uh, is what I say. This discourse is to bring uh, out the sustainability and the growth potential of the company. Understood. Understood. Right. My uh, second question is on the uh, capital allocation. Uh, I, I understand that uh, uh, recently uh, your files, your stock exchange filing indicates some broad contours of how you will be using the 750 crores which is coming in. But if you look at it, uh, we had a cash balance uh, more than 500 crores uh, before this. Now our cash balance is almost close to it, must be more than 200 crores. So I'm just uh, wondering uh, uh, how we can effectively use this resources uh, without uh, diluting ROCs. Um, uh, what is what is your vision for this in the near term? I, of course, long term you will have much more better sync. You can go for acquisitions whenever it uh, whenever it is uh, uh, makes sense. But near term, do we find any use for this cash? So, uh, just to answer on this, uh, if, we, if you see the first object of our utilization is on the uh, tech development, and uh, the AI development would not be very significant in one or two years. The time to utilize this money is, say, December 27, which is about four years from now. 
So ROC, adjusted ROC or ROCE will not get impacted till we have delivered and consumed the, the, the amount mentioned in the object clause for the purpose of innovative tech developments, right? So the impact is going to be very smaller as we will remain uh, large on cash balances uh, for the period of the development of over four years. question is from the line of Ankur Bhaiti from JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, my question is regarding the digital ad market dynamics in India. Uh, it's a uh, fact that it continues to remain healthy, but there are ad publishers like Truecaller, Daily Hunt, ShareChat, which have seen year-on-year -year decline or slowdown in ad revenues in 2023, largely driven by falling CPM, while ad impression growth and other variables continues to remain strong. So I wanted to know that which pockets in the market are underperforming and seeing weaker growth momentum, and what's growing what's driving the low CPM in such pockets of the market? Thanks, Ankur, for that question. And uh, see, I've, I've been in this business for over 18 years, and I have mentioned this uh, for over the last five years to public market investors since we were in the roadshow of the IPO, that the only way, and I say it again to our industry as well, the only way that in emerging markets, that one could run a 20 plus percent or 25 percent EBITDA company is not by selling the commodity of impressions on CPM prices. That business is too commoditized because you're selling, there is, in India alone, you have 650 million smartphone users who on an average are per capita usage of, you know, time usage of, or data usage of internet on smartphone devices in India would be one of the highest in the world. So the number of Impressions that are getting generated on all of these kind of ads is an ocean of those impressions. Now, the impression itself uh, of the, the fact that people are using their smartphone devices and generating impressions it is not where the value lies. The value lies is in when you jump into that ocean of impressions, jumping deep with unique equipment like the DMP, the MFAS, the you know, deeper uh, connects with the OEM ecosystem, uh, you know, deeper products with vernacular verticalization in there. And then you find those pearls of conversions where the user has actually converted or delivered an ROI to the advertiser. When you bring that out, then you charge a pricing of increasing CPC rate of 56 rupees or so on to make a 20% EBITDA into this quarter. That is how the business is differentiated. Now, we are a buyer of impressions. We are a buyer of impressions from a lot of the publishers. So we know that what is happening. Of course, this is demand and supply economics. There's way more impressions and consumer adoption of digital today than the advertiser has shifted their budgets to digital. In emerging markets, the total ad spend versus total digital ad spend ratio still has a lot of catching up to do, but the consumer has gone into digital big time. So there is a lot more impressions than, a, than the budget to buy those um, impressions. So in terms of demand and supply, the impression would go down. And as uh, intelligence becomes more consumer-oriented, uh, then the value of each particular placement is, let's say, not as important. Now, if I can get you uh, converted uh, to you know a particular advertiser, um, on a less premium uh, placement, then I will find a way to do that, right? So because that's where optimization comes in, and algorithms, AI, machine learning, all of that is working to achieve that. So I wouldn't uh, look into this data point with um, with nervousness. I would look at it with deeper understanding that, yes, there is a lot of digital uh, consumption from consumers. There's a lot more ad spend coming from the advertisers into the ecosystem, with the right business model, there is a good amount of consistent money to be made. And I think Apple has been doing it for more than a, almost a decade. I mean, I do not know of any other ad tech company that is focused 75% on emerging markets and is consistently cash flow positive for more than a decade. And I think that's to do with the fact that we, uh, we saw it this way, that you have to sell something more higher value 
take more risk, sell something higher value, and run a system which is differentiated. And that is why uh, you can be sure that Apple will defend its pricing and will continue to charge more and inch upward a step at a time to deliver better margin. Thanks. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Animesh Yadav from Puratna Investment Advisor. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for the opportunity uh, and good set of numbers. So, uh, first question, a few quarters back, uh, you know, you shared with us that you have outlined a clear and a concise action plan and uh, you expected that to turn around from Q2 onwards. So, how do you see that? Uh, is it on track? And has Q2 numbers come up in terms of your expectation or is there any setback which you see? Secondly, uh, if you can share and guide us in terms of how do you expect that to reflect in terms of the measurable outcomes for Q3 uh, and Q4 uh, for that. Thanks for your question, sir. Um, in our commentary, I think we have already answered almost all of your questions. But let's put it this way. In Q1, which was in May 2023, I announced that we had to do an emergency operation on our developed market, internal operation on our teams. And that was a decisive action plan, which is uh, not for the faint-hearted. Okay? And we took that head-on. We talked about it very clearly. We took those steps, and the operation was largely completed within the first quarter by June end of let's say it is by July, the operation was done. The recovery period was, you know, August, September, and so on. In the month of October, I can tell you that we have fully sorted out that operation. We have fully cured, and we are full guns blazing with the largest motivated team of salespeople on ground in developed markets than we've ever had, and our products, our partnerships, I think we have, we have got a much stronger position than ever before in developed markets, and therefore I'm confident that we will deliver uh, consistent, dependable uh, growth in developed markets from here onwards. Okay. Of, of course, we cannot change the macroeconomic factors, but what we can do is have health strategies to cope with it, like we have across different verticals in India and global emerging markets. Similarly, in developed markets, we have the same broad-based cross-industry verticals growth strategy. So yes, last quarter, FinTech had a pullback. We could quantify it. And uh, we had a pullback in India. And we will quantify it. And, and yes, deliver uh, dependable, sensible, bottom-line sensible results. And I think we'll be fine. Uh, you know, I'm taking into account that internal issues are fully sorted out and we are out there to uh, achieve our highest potential. Macroeconomic factors uh, permitting, we should be doing well consistently. If there is any particular industry vertical where there is any pullback effect, we will keep this transparency of quantifying it, bringing it back to you, and, you know, keeping it measurable, but at the same time building the trust that, hey, we have a broad-based growth coming in the company, and we will not be set back, you know, one-off setbacks here and there. Those are just hiccups in the journey, which any mature company should be able to deal with, and I think Apple is certainly dealing with it gracefully and we're going to continue to deliver growth. Sorry, thank you for helping. Sorry, I joined it, so that's why I left it. Uh, so just a follow-up uh, to Kapil. Uh, so, other expenses look to be a bit uh, high this quarter. So, anything specific out of that or like it, it, it is just, I mean, just, I mean, it, it is in line in terms of your expectation? So, it is in line with our expectation. Uh, the amount which is added is more like more coming from the acquisition of URP. And uh, certain uh, this is a period where we invest on marketing activity as the festive season. So we uh, invest more in Q2 in, in the road shows and other things. Uh, so this is in line with our expectation. Nothing exciting. Got it. Thank you. Thank That's you. Thank 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 you. The next question is from the line of Swapnil from GM, GMFFL. Please go ahead. Hey, hi. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. A couple of questions. Uh, first, a clarification. Uh, you mentioned that there was a hit of around 11 crores because of the uh, GST uh, changes that happened in the uh, gaming industry. Now, I just wanted to understand, uh, 
uh, were the changes uh, uh, the Elon crore uh, impact that you mentioned was that for the entire quarter or uh, that was uh, uh, from the time the uh, the gst notification came in uh, so i'll take this question anuj uh, this noted this change came in july and uh, the the behavior of the clients changed immediately because they wanted to figure out what could happen because 28% cutting out from the amount deposited by them uh, had a significant bearing so everybody was recalibrating their strategies and waiting for first october to come in when it used to, where it will kick in so the the impact was in q2 we will see how much it, it gets eased out in q3 and we are yet to see a significant change in the behavior at the moment so we are in close touch with the clients to see how it impacts q3 or q4 going forward okay that's helpful uh, and second question is with respect to your develop ma- markets uh, uh, trends right uh, now I, i i was doing some back of the uh, mind calculations so here yeah, and i realized that uh, your uh, revenue in developed markets in q was around 70 crores now if i adjust the uh, current uh, quarter's revenue that you mentioned uh, 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 you know if i adjust for the uip acquisition and then i add up the uh, 14 uh, 14 odd crores uh, impact that you mentioned on fintech still uh, your quarterly revenue is around 55 crores now that's a difference of around 15 crores on a yy basis uh, around 20 odd crores on a q on q basis now i fail to understand like uh, 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 where is this uh, difference coming from I, I think I have already given the I have already given the detailed breakup and the analysis of our numbers. And what I can tell you absolutely is that in developed markets today, I'm not sure exactly what Excel sheet you're analyzing on. But I would encourage that we talk uh, to the investor relations team and get the correct set of numbers. But for developed markets today, our revenue, our progression, so it's about roughly 25% of our revenues overall for this quarter is developed markets. and that you can already do the math on a 431 crore 25% that is the number for developed market this quarter you take out you add the you add this you take out the pull back effect and so on whatever slice and dice we do i can tell you one thing for sure our position our number of active customers in developed markets on a broad basis in the three world field today is stronger than ever before our number of sales people on the ground who are passionate believing in what we are taking to the market and they come from competitor companies and they are top talent in the industry are very committed and confident that we can deliver growth and success our pipeline is strong and there is and by the way the market is so large in developed markets there are numbers whether you take the numbers that you have or what i'm saying is a very small number so from a small base with a competitive product to grow from here is what is most important so where are we today we are higher in developed markets than ever before we have solved our issues internal ones external ones we have quantified for you we have a strong pipeline and we are going for consistent progressive growth from here quarter on quarter and on a small base in a large market with a differentiated position and with a inspired team and with the leadership that i was directly talking to you about it right now today we are directly on the ground making it happen so i can tell you that that is the reality on the ground we can keep doing the slice and dice of the pack and it's super important to do that and i've tried my best to give that to you in the commentary today sure anuj uh, uh, if you can just quantify the number x of uip for developed markets it would be really helpful uh, all right i'll quantify it one more time okay so in this quarter 75% of our business is india plus emerging markets roughly 25% is developed markets in the developed markets most a lot of the contribution is coming from the us a little very little contribution from europe and let's say japan but overall when we look at developed markets about 25% of our total revenue is there usd has been a positive contributor within that and has helped to strengthen our position in developed markets especially in gaming world in terms of fintech we have already mentioned that why in developed markets especially in us there was a pull back effect and we have quantified that to be 14 crores so these are the numbers and this is all in my commentary proactively disclosed and we can do all the analysis on the past but what's most important is where are we today 
and what does it mean going forward? And I think we have given you some deep insights on that as well. Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rafnil. Appreciate your question. The next question is from the line of Rahul Jain from Dolat Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, <clears throat> hope I'm audible. Uh, firstly, uh, you know, uh, just wanting your uh, big picture kind of a view. Of course, you mentioned this in some certain ways. Uh, but with the changing mix of business, uh, both in terms of the technology that we offer and the mix of market and all, what is the best way to understand the uh, potential uh, growth in the various markets if we have to fly between India, other emerging and developed markets, both from near as well as medium term basis? See, our long term growth trends, uh, I will anchor deeply on that. And, you know, had we not been, you know, uh, consistent about our growth vision for 2030, we would have not uh, taken some of those actions that we have always talked about. You know, so I think our, group, our clarity of thought, you know, our confidence in our capabilities, the commitment to pursue it relentlessly and being resilient to changing, you know, dynamics and situations, I think all of that puts us in a position of a lot of strength. And with that, the big picture view that we have, uh, Rahul, is very, very clear that we are going to continue to keep a strong, broad-based growth trend across our India and emerging markets, and we are going to consistently push for more premiumness so that we can improve our margins, our pricing, and position in the ecosystem. Now, uh, the mix of markets, India and emerging markets globally, I think it is fair to say that these markets for next let's say three to four years, will continue to deliver broad-based growth uh, for the whole industry and, of course, for us. The difference between everyone else and us is that we are gunning for only the profit pools in this growth segment, right? So when you see growth coming, okay, digital advertising is going to grow, but not every dollar of growth is worth 20% of data plus operations, you know? So we have to pick those segments of growth where we see... Um, you know, the profit pools are robust enough uh, for us to make an ROI for the advertiser, charge sufficiently, make margins for ourselves. And so we are very selective about which pockets of growth we are going for. And with that, we should be able to deliver good growth in India and global emerging markets. In developed markets, we, uh, the, the, of course, those markets are called developed because, you know, there's already a lot of growth that has happened. And so there is going to be, at a macro level, lesser growth there. However... The addressable market is so large, our base being small, we should be able to notch up, you know, and hit above our weight to get better growth for our own selves in absolute basis, better than industry average growth in developed markets. So our, our long-term growth thesis hasn't changed. You also asked about the short term, and I think just purely in the context and acknowledging the fact that our company is going to complete, Apple India is going to complete 18 financial years, by the end of this financial year, I, I, I took a little bit of a liberty to, to emphasize that we will, and we will aim to reach the 18 billion INR, which is 1800 crore revenue mark this year. And we are, I think we are well poised to, to work towards that direction. And it's largely in this context to, to, to connect the dots to you that I'm saying so. But I think the important thing is the big picture and uh, the tailwinds uh, continue to be favorable with that longer-term view. Uh, I just one small clarification. When you said the addressable time is big, so you're saying about the total time or you're talking about this uh, time with, where uh, a 20% margin can be achieved even by the aspect of it is, is a very large market. See, your, your voice is not very clear, but, you know, you're perhaps asking about the total TAM or the TAM where the margins are large enough. I'm, no, I'm talking about the, there is uh, there is broad-based digital advertising growth that is expected to be very positive uh, uh, for India and global emerging markets. Now, that is something that is undisputed. I think any industry report you'll pick up is going to tell you that digital advertising is set to grow for many years to come in global emerging markets because it is undercalibrated versus what it is in developed markets. In China, in U.S., in Europe, I believe that there is more than 
70-75% of the total ad spend is digital. But we are nowhere close in India and other emerging markets to that percentage. So we will see higher calibration of ad, ad spends going to digital. So that is a large total addressable market. Within that total addressable market, Apple makes very clear, calculated decisions about which pockets of uh, this growth should we have as our revenue. Because we are not gunning for every revenue in the market. If the pricing is too low, I would rather not take that campaign than to take it. Right? So it's very important to run an organization with a discipline. And the discipline to our sales team is that, hey, this is the range of pricing. This is how we work. And if we are not seeing sufficient um, ROI for the advertiser and margin for ourselves, it's better not to do that that revenue. Right? So, so therefore, we are picking our battles carefully. And we think there is sufficient... Uh, growth that we will derive in this market, and that will be premium in nature, and we will get profitable, sustainable growth going forward, therefore. I uh, appreciated the color. And lastly, if I can squeeze in uh, about this uh, announcement of Elad, uh, so do you see uh, uh, the management bandwidth getting slightly thinner and more responsibility coming up for you, or we would look for right replacement? No, I think uh, I, I don't see that to be the case. Whenever we acquire a company, there will always be, um, you know, a clear transition that must happen. When we did the acquisitions post our IPO, this was COVID times. And because it was COVID times, we maintained the structure of the deal in such a way that we took a three-year view to the full transition, integration, and getting the acquired assets to the level of... Uh, unit economics that uh, that we wanted them to come to. Now, since that has been achieved in some of those acquired assets, it's time for complete transition and, and so on. So I think a large uh, move uh, is expected and it has happened honorably, it has happened effortlessly, and, you know, it's the right thing to happen. Thank you. That's it for me. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Omkar from Shree Investment. Please go ahead. Yes, good morning. My question was regarding, if you look at your results, you have given the segregation of segment and revenue, India and outside India. So if you look at the revenue growth for outside India, it's about 25%. But when you look at the margin, uh, the, gr the growth in the margin is at least... Uh, it's around 7 to 8 percent. That means there is compression in the margin, and that is around 70 percent of the overall business. So, can you articulate what's the issue, issue on that front? So, so, if you see our uh, results, there is a footnote below the segment that the segment is based on the billing entity, whereas the earning presentation is based on the user, where the user is based and where the ad has been served. So the, those data are not comparable, right? So this data is given uh, in the earning presentation for better understanding of geographically uh, where the consumer is and how the market in that geography is responding. So as Anush mentioned earlier, it is consumer behavior which drives the growth and adoption uh, by the consumer. So that is why we give a different set of numbers based on the location of the ad where it was served and the where the consumer is located. And that is why the, the reporting on the geographical uh, information on the result sheet would always be a little different. Uh, in India also, uh, in standalone India, we would deliver certain ads which are outside India, so that will move to the other geographies. So they are not comparable numbers. Please see the footnote of the, uh, the segment too. Yeah, okay, so, but if you look at the margins uh, within India and outside of India, excluding uh, the uh, excluding the developed markets, what kind of margins are this uh, comparable to India? So the margin definitely would be higher in the uh, international markets as we have been stating that the CPC pricing is higher in the international markets as compared to India. The unit economics in India is much more tougher than the uh, the the developed market and other markets, uh, right? So we we if you see our DRHP, you will see the CPUC rate multiples. Both that we are not been giving it, 
that you can get an idea from the old records available publicly. Uh, you will uh, you will be able to understand better that the, the India is the most toughest human economics uh, geography to operate in. Okay, the second question is on the growth of CPCU. Uh, even though your uh, con conversion rate has, the growth in the conversion rate has fallen down, the pricing has improved. So is that going to be the strategy uh, going forward? I think the, uh, the strategy on, on, uh, is, is going to be that we must maximize the growth as well as the pricing by, uh, I don't see that it has to be one or the other. I think both have to grow. You know, we're going to drive for more conversions. We're going to drive for more, uh, uh, more pricing as well. And I think, uh, both of these factors are very strong, uh, you know, defensible modes of the company, the ability to drive conversion, the ability to find those consumers who are going to be doing the necessary conversions, the premium placements, partnerships, uh, touch points across um, uh, mobile uh, as well as uh, connected TV and so on. This is the strength and capability of our platform and our product. And, of course, uh, uh, being able to deliver an ROI link business model and improving pricing, both are very, very important. I wouldn't say that... Um, but you should go by one particular, uh, uh, you know, year or a few quarters of trend because this this year has been, uh, you know, slightly different from our our usual pattern of growth. Right? We see we saw pullbacks of various kinds, internal issues related to jam, uh, external macroeconomic factors related to certain verticals and certain markets at different times. So this year was a complex year in that sense. But um, if you ask me for the long term going forward. Am I bullish about more smartphone users and connected TV users doing more active digital conversions? Yes. Would you see higher value of digital conversions happening from consumers going forward and higher um, frequency of those conversions? Absolutely. And so given those factors, I'm pretty confident that the number of conversions should continue to rise and should keep up with the long-term growth trends. And on pricing, I think I've answered it a few times on this call today. The last question, uh, Omkar sir, can you uh, can, can back in the queue? Clearly, what would sir? be? Uh, yeah. Sorry for the interruption. Can you get back in the queue for the follow-up question? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the last question for today. I now hand the conference over to management for closing comments. All right. Uh, Thank you so much for your uh, very uh, in interesting questions, uh, especially related to the strategies of the company going forward. Um, I'm very confident that our company is in a better position today than ever before. And as, a, as an 18-year-old, as a young corporate adult, uh, Apple has you know, definitely been brought up very well. And I'm very optimistic about how we will shape up going forward in you know, many years to come. Uh, I would look forward to, you know, the upcoming EGM. For those of you already shareholders in the company, please participate. Uh, give us uh, your participation and support. And uh, I wish you a very, very happy Deepavali. Um, and maybe may the next year be even more successful and prosperous for every single one of you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, with season's greetings for the festive season. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of LRR Securities Private Limited, that concludes the conference call. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your line.